I'm Gary Cole. You're listening to the Football Coaching Life podcast brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. Today's guest is Tom Samani, arguably one of the most successful coaches uh, in Australia. You'll, you'll get to listen to Tom and understand that he's um, he he doesn't say that himself. He's a fairly unassuming sort of a character. The reason I can say it, he's one of the few coaches to have been to five World Cups, three with the Matildas, one with Canada as assistant coach, and now he's also been to one with the Football Ferns from New Zealand. A wonderful guest. He's coached in uh, Australia, in Japan, in Malaysia. Um, also at the AIS, he's coached at Westford High School. A broad brush of football experiences. So welcome to our today's guest, Tom Samani, currently head coach of the Football Ferns. Welcome, Tom. Yeah, good, good afternoon, Gary. How are you? It's good to be here. <laughs> it is good. Good to catch up again. This is this yeah. is we had we did have a little practice at this a wee while ago. So <laughs> hopefully it goes as well as the, the practice. <laughs> I wish you could remember the answers from the last time. So l- let's start in a very similar way. You you are a Scottish Australian. Um, yes. how, how the bloody hell did you get an Italian name? Yes, Scottish, Italian, Australian. <laughs> My grandfather was actually Italian. So there's a little Italian community in, in Glasgow. Um, a lot of Italians came out from Tuscany just after the First World War. Uh, things were pretty tough over there at that time, apparently. Um, and, and he came out and uh, married uh, a Scottish woman. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> so you... Uh, you... You're more into um, pasta than haggis? Um, I'm certainly more into pasta <laughs> than haggis. But unfortunately, <laughs> can only speak Scottish. Okay, enough of that small talk. So tell us, Tom, how did you, you... You obviously had a great career as a player in junior football in Scotland and, and came out to Australia. How did you get into coaching? Um, it was just kind of a natural progression, I think, Gary. Uh, you know, it's a, I think probably a variety of things. One is that as you continue playing, you get near the end of your career, it's still good to feel in, involved in the game. I think there's always a challenge. You know, I think um, I was always keen to see how I could do it, coaching like a, a lot of ex-players do. Uh, and I think um, just the way that things developed at Canberra, so I was playing with uh, um, Canberra City, which had a various um, uh, different names <laughs> through the years. <laughs> And, and I kind of fell from being, you know, the oldest player on the team, being the captain, being the player spokesperson, to then being a player coach and then to sort of, you know, ending up getting into coaching. And, you know, so that, that's kind of how it happened. But I think also the, the challenge of the job um, was something that appealed to me. Were you ready to coach? I don't think MD's ready to coach. <laughs> I think that's one thing that you, find, you learn or that you find out later in years. In later years, you, you know, when you go into it, you don't know what you don't know, which in some ways is a bit of a blessing. <laughs> um, you, suddenly you get to my age, you do know what you don't know. Um, and you think back and you think of all the things you did, particularly back then when you go, what was I thinking? You know, I, I, I don't think anybody really, uh, particularly when you come straight from a playing background and then straight into to coaching and you're thrown in at the deep end. Um, I, you know, it's kind of learning on the job. And hopefully, particularly the first few years, almost like surviving those few years, even though you're not in survival mode. But when you think back, you think, you know, I was very fortunate that I made it through those years due to, you know, a combination of factors. Yeah. I, um, at the time that you started your head coaching role, I was also in Canberra working with um, Ronnie Smith at the AIS. And you made a what I thought could have been a big mistake because you signed me to to, to play with, uh, with you in your spare in my spare time um, at Canberra, yeah. Croatia. Yeah. How important was that for you as a coach? That first coaching opportunity to to get to know the ropes and get a feel for what was going on. I think it's very important. I think that you know when you again at the time you don't think that, but when you think back, you thought, well, that that really sort of sets you up. For either going forward or going going elsewhere and getting a a, a, a saner job, um, but I think it, it did, and I think I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate for a whole lot of circumstances that took me to that job, and my sort of playing coaching career um, started with me me and you in sort of midfield up front as a dynamic duel. Um, 
or more like an arthritic duel. Um, the, um, I think I was fortunate that I was at Canberra, Croatia, and they, they gave me the time to help develop. And, uh, and they also um, helped me because the, the Croatians had a particularly good way of actually wanting to play football. They actually loved the football. And, and if you've got good players and the team's playing well, they appreciate that and they support that. So I think I was very lucky that when I started out, I was in that environment. You know, and you look at the Croatians, they're, they're, sort of, they're all about six foot four and they look big, tough guys, but they, they love football. And I think if you bring good football to them or, or have that kind of philosophy, they'll support you. So I, I was very lucky that my first gig, if you like, I went into that kind of um, that kind of environment that, um, that, that helped me then sort of, sort of progress, if you like. If someone had said to you at that point, what's your coaching philosophy, um, would that be different? Well, one, would you have had one? And two, that, would that be different from what it is today? Um, it, it probably wouldn't be too different. I, I probably wouldn't have been able to answer the question, if, if I'm being honest, at, the, at that time. I don't know if I can quite answer it now, but I think, I, I think the way that I've wanted to play and the way that I've wanted to try and develop players, um, I don't think that philosophically has changed. Um, in the pragmatic world of coaching, I've had to change at times because you might not be able to, to do that and you have to deal with the realities of the job. So it's okay to say we want to play like Barcelona, but if you don't have Barcelona's <laughs> players, it can be somewhat difficult. So, um, but I, I've, I think I've always had a, I suppose if I'm summing up my philosophy, I prefer to be someone that would go out to try and win a game as opposed to go out to try not to lose a game. Yeah. If I had to sum up in a sort of simplistic sentence. <laughs> Very well summed up. Tom, on your playing journey, was there a, did you did you come across a coach uh, and let me cut across myself there a little bit probably fair to say that in the mid to late 80s coaching was was the beginning of um, you know the coaching program we had coaching licenses began and those sorts of things and prior to that people went into coaching or managing call it what you like they there were people that could rant and rave there were people that could swear and slam doors and this that and the other but was there was there on your journey as a player was there someone that coached you that made an impact and went you know what i i, I like that I, I i think i could do that um i don't think there was so much that because back when you know when uh my playing days, that kind of coaching didn't quite quite exist. What I did have, fortunately, was a couple of coaches that believed in how I played. And I think that helped me play and that helped me develop. Um, and, I, and I think that was probably more important. You know, if I think back now, I think, I wish some of those guys had, had coached me a little bit as you players get coached today, if you like. Yeah. Um, with a bit more information, a bit more tactics, et cetera, et cetera. But it, you were kind of often left up to your own devices. But I think that the key thing for me or the important thing for me was having a coach that kind of believed in, in how you played. Um, yeah. And then that gave you the, the confidence to play. Yeah. No, and, and you certainly did that. I, I think in the back of my head, you you were someone that really believed in attacking football and were prepared to take risks in your early days as a coach to, to, to score goals. Is that something that's stayed with you and is that a part of that experience? It, it has been when I've been in a situation that's allowed me to do that. And I think that's, as a coach, that's the situation that, that you need to, to get to. Um, and if I can sort of use an example of that, when I came back to the Matildas in 2005, so I'd been there from 94 to 97, when the program basically started. Uh, when I came back in 95, we very quickly went into Asia, which changed the dynamic significantly. Um, so up until then, even when I went back in 2005, the Matildas were perceived as a competitive, strong, aggressive, you know, teams that the teams never really wanted to play against, but they weren't perceived as a good footballing team. And they weren't perceived as a team that were lightly to win games. So we had to change that dynamic over those years when we went into Asia, because suddenly we had to qualify for the World Cup by beating Japan, beating China, 
And, and you weren't just going to do that by being physical, well-organized, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So we had to then change the whole dynamic of how we trained, how we played, look at try, players that we tried to develop and change our, our footballing style. Um, so the, the answer is that, yeah, you, you always want to get to there. You know, sometimes you either don't get time to get there or you won't have the team to get there. Um, for example, where I've got New Zealand at the moment, we're very much a blue collar team. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what Australia was when I came in 2005. By the time I think I left in 2012, we had a number of young dynamic players, Sam Kerr, Caitlin Fords, Hayley Razzo, Alana Kennedy, um, uh, Emily Van Egmond, et cetera, Steph Catley, et cetera, et cetera, who were really then good footballers. So yeah. I think as a coach, although you might not start with your team, you've got to try and continue to build and develop your team and try to develop in a, a better style of play, a more attacking style of play, uh, trying to develop individual players in the team into, a, if you like, a philosophy, a mindset, whatever you want to call it, of actually then going out and winning games. And, uh, and I've kind of had that kind of philosophy, I think, generally throughout my coaching career. So then in developing players, what is coaching? It's a really good question. I think it's a I think it's a, a mix of things. You know, I think there's a there's a tactical side of it that you you know you have to you have to be able to give players information or your system or whatever you want to do. But then I think there's also very much an individual side of it. And I think that individual side is uh, being able to get the very best out of the players that you've got. And I think quite often you have players that have more to give. And I think one of the, the challenges for a coach is to see those players and to then develop those, those players um, by stuff on the field, yep. uh, by giving them the confidence to play and by giving them scope to, to develop their games. You know, it's a bit like when I came back to Canberra, we had Ned Zellick in, in the team. You know, so what are you going to do with Ned Zellick? Say, Ned, just play at the back there and when you get the ball, you know, just pass it in the midfield. <laughs> yeah, no, you say, yeah, you get the ball and you can come forward, <laughs> do whatever you like. Do what you like. So, so, yeah, so so it's a combination. Now, you don't have all Ned Zellix in your team. You might have another centre half where you say, basically, when you get the ball, you pass it to Ned. So so it's it's the combination of the development of, of individuals. Um, and some of that is what I do, or what I call in, informal coaching. It's not necessarily on a in a structured session, it might be. 10 minutes at the end or 10 minutes at the start where you take a player and you, you know, you show them various things, whether it be body positions, whether it be where you want them to make runs to get them to think and develop the games. So I think, you know, for me, so there's a whole range of combinations in coaching, but that's purely the football side. There's also the non-football side, which is as critical <laughs> and probably costs more, play, more coaches of jobs than the actual football side because we all tend to have a reasonable knowledge of the game we all tend to have a reasonable knowledge tactically um how we decide to do that obviously varies from from coach to coach um but then there's also that other side of the game that you've also got to master if you want to stay in the game great answer tom you're listening to The Football Coaching Life, a podcast brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. Our guest today is head coach of the Football Ferns, Tom Somani. Let's keep this moving along, Tom. I, I, I keep pinching myself. I, I read this out, but you've been now to five World Cups with three different countries uh, as a coach and as assistant coach uh, over, a, over a, a decent span of years now. On your coaching journey, how have you as a coach changed or developed? Um, I think I've, I've changed. So I went into coaching like I think a lot of people do. You go in and you think, I'm going to be in charge of this. I'm going to run this. Players are going to do what I tell them. Things are going to be in line. I'm going to be able to do all that. And then you suddenly find there's all <laughs> these other variety of things that you have to deal with, um, you know, from the, from the chairman, from, you know, the, the board member who's got a son and or daughter in the team from, you know, a whole range of things that get thrown at you. Um, so I think um, what I've, I think I feel that as I've gone along and, and reached the stage that where I have now, 
I, what I do now is I, I kind of feel comfortable in what my management style is yeah. and, and, and how I operate. So I kind of went in with, with this idea of this is what you do and, you know, you set up a whole lot of rules and regulations and you have all these perceptions, basically coming, probably coming from your playing days as well. Yeah. I think what I've done over time is I've become, um, as I say, more comfortable and confident in the, the management style that I have and, and how I operate. And um, and I think that's kind of changed over the years. And to be fair, the ch- players and society and other things have have changed over the years. And I think also um, having been coached a lot of my career in national teams, that's a slightly different dynamic than coaching in club teams as well. So, you know, if anything, I think I've just constantly sort of refined how, how I do things and suddenly realized that, yeah, this kind of, this worked for me. Not always. <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> You're a better leader today than you were at the beginning? Uh, y- yes, I think so. Um, I'm a more, because I feel I'm a more confident leader than I was at the beginning. I, I, when I say at the beginning, I think you go in with confidence and, and to the, not brashness, because I've never sort of been a, a brash person, but you go in with really, probably like a, um, a a teacher goes into a classroom at first, you know, they think they're going to sort of change the world and you have those views. You learn as you go along that, that it's not that's not always going to happen. But I think now what I am is a, a lot more comfortable in my leadership across the board, dealing with the you know the, the board members that the upwards the hierarchy etc and then also dealing with whatever it is supporters media is uh, your, your staff and then obviously your players so i feel that i'm I've, I've got a much better handle on the job now it's taken probably 30 odd years but i've got a, a better handle on the job and how the job operates than what i did in the past because of that you know Back in the Canberra Croatia days, you manage a, uh, a team of players. Um, you, you might have had a trainer. You washed the kits yourself. Yeah. Um, you might have put the nets up yourself. Compared yeah. that today, we're mas- managing a national team with strength and conditioning, all of the support staff um, around all of that. It, it's a the roles significantly changed for you, hasn't it? Very much so. I mean, at times you kind of feel. Um, not, not not useless, not worthless, but you feel you don't do an awful lot at, at times. You know, like you say, when you go back to those, those days, you, you did, you did it, you brought your kit. I used to take the bibs home, <laughs> wash them. I actually had Alice and mate a set of bibs once because the lights were rubbish at, at Deacon. And um, we, I got her to go out and get some light material so we had bright, <laughs> bright, bright bibs. So you did all, all those things, and, and, and which is a great upbringing, by the way. And I think... Absolutely. I think Everybody should do it. You know, I think it's very, very important. And um, now you, you go along, like you say, you've got your, your fitness guy throwing numbers at you. You've got your um, analyst throwing video at you. And and the challenge now um, is discerning all the information that you get so that you pick out the right stuff and not get overloaded with the stuff yeah. that's happening, you know, around the team. Uh, and and that's, that is now the challenge. You know, your staffs are bigger. Um, the number of people you deal with are, are greater. Um, you, you get out of habits of doing stuff. I, I can't remember the last time I did a warm up. Yeah. I can't remember. You know, you go back to those days at Deakin. You you organised the pre season as well, so you did all the running and you did all the stuff there. If somebody said to me now, uh, you know, I need two weeks fitness session. Can you do two weeks for me? I'd be at a loss because I haven't done it for so long. <laughs> so you do, and and I miss that. I miss kind of being in the mix, yep. if you like, and being hands-on. Um, I think I think I'm a reasonable delegator in the sense that um, I let people get on with their jobs, but I, I'm, I think I must frustrate staff as well who give me all this information and I kind of, you know, that like I get a video at the end of games with all these things cut and I say, well, I actually need to look at the game myself because yeah. I don't know what I want to see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's it, it's different, and the number of people you deal with now compared to what you did back then, where it actually used to be a little bit more about the football, or almost all about the football, 
you know, there's so many other facets now to the job. Tom, along the way, as you've grown and developed, have you had a coaching mentor or mentors? Um, and ha- ha- has that changed? Do you still use them today? And how important do you think that is, particularly maybe for, for young coaches beginning on their journey? I think it's really important, and, and, and I still do it. I, um, I think it's really important to have people that you can run things past, that you can, that you can sit down and talk to and know that you'll get um, a point of view that, that um, might either confirm what you want to do or might actually change your mind in, in what you want to do. You know, obviously, I probably like yourself, Ron, um, Ron Smith was very much and still very much is one of one of those people um, that I, I consult with and I chat with in football and I run tactics by him, etc. And you know, and he's such a great motivator for yeah. me as well because he, he gives you fresh ideas. He's, you know what he's like, loves a chat, and he'll come up he with a hundred and one different ideas and stuff to think about. And and I feel that you know that's really refreshing. Um, you know, and uh, you know, and, and I speak to and I speak to young coaches as well because I think they come up and they give you. You know, it, I don't think it's a job or, or it's a big mistake to think. Well, I've been in the job thirty years. I know what I'm doing because I don't. Um, there's a lot of stuff now that you know. There's young coaches doing that. You think, oh, that's a good idea. I, well, I hadn't thought of that. Um, so it's really important to keep your communication going. You know, across the board. Yeah. Um, but also speak a lot to Mike Hickman and Hickey. I've known for probably nearly 40 years now, or probably 40 years. Very different to me. Hickey is, you know, particularly when he started out, was your sergeant major coach. He was your guy. <laughs> he, was your, he was your fitness guy. He was your, and, but the, thing, the great thing about Hickey that I love, which I'm not good at, is that if there was an issue, he would confront it head on. Bang. And then when it was sorted, he would, he would move on. I'm, I'm not a great confrontationalist. To, to be honest, it's just not in my nature. You have to be as a coach, it's part of the job. Yeah. But it's not a part of the job that, um, that you know, a lot of coaches love that part of the job. <laughs> it's, it's not a part of the job that I've, I'll be honest, that I really love, unless I get very, very angry. Um, but Hickey is a guy, you know, that I can talk to him about football and, and I can get, you know, some football knowledge and sense, if that makes sense. Um, and and can chat freely with him, um, and and get some some good ideas, and he refreshes me in, in that regard, and he helps me in a sense when I do have to confront something, yeah. you know, to actually get in there and confront it. So you've been blessed with a couple, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that that's within our game, Tom. You coached at the AIS, you coached at Westfield High, and um, you've done a range of other things. Have coaches from other sports influenced how you've coached? Um, I don't know if they've influenced to a degree, but I, I, certainly it's been helpful during my career, particularly, as you know, at the AIS, when you bump into all sorts of sports um, and you sit down and you chat to them and find out. For me, it's more about not so much the coaching, but the management yeah. of, of how they manage things. Because a lot of things, you know, AIS coaches are, you know, usually national coaches and picking teams for Olympics, World Cups, etc. So a lot of things that I would do, whether it be normal plumber with the netball, um, you know, the, the hockey coaches, the basketball coaches would be, you know, how, how do you do it? How do you manage this? So how do you manage your, your selection? How do you actually inform players, etc.? So it's more, for me, not necessarily so much about the, the technical parts of, of the sport, but more about the, the management parts of it that I found other, other codes and other coaches really helpful. My name's Gary Cole. You're listening to the Football Coaching Life podcast brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. Our guest today is Head, head Football Ferns coach, Tom Samani. Tom... Easy for you to say. Yeah, yeah, it is. You can tell this is not a professional gig. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you do it? Uh, that's a really good question. I, um, Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I think... I enjoy the continued challenge. I enjoy the environment. You know, I enjoy, um, you know, I, I feel that it's a blessing that my age, I'm actually still involved in the game and still actively employed. I mean, I think that's that's a bonus. But just to be in an environment where you're around um, high achieving young young players, keen staff, um, 
and and just you, you're still playing a sport. You're actually out in a football ground playing football. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, things can't get much better than that. So yeah. you look and you say, well, what, what's the alternative? Uh, what's a better alternative? And I, and I can't really think of one. Probably being an assistant coach is maybe one because <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the pressure. Um, but, uh, the, um, but just, you know, I just feel so privileged still to be out there. Um, and it kind of, let's say, it keeps, you, it, it keeps you on your toes. You know, you've got to be, you can't turn into an old fogey. You know, you, you've got to be careful of the gear you wear and, and, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, it keeps you on your toes. And I, and I just think being in that environment and being so lucky that I've been in it fairly constantly uh, since I've been playing, it, it's just been such a, you know, a, a real blessing. Yeah. I love it. I love it. After uh, leaving the Matildas, you took up a position as head coach with the USA women's team. Um, w went off, won the Algarve Cup, I think won 13 games in a row, going through a bit of a rebuilding process. And then then that role came to an end. Um, how that, that doesn't matter how that happens for all of us, that, that hurts. But how important is resilience and learning how to deal with that? How important is that for a coach? It's critical for a coach, and it's not just because that, that was actually the first time I'd lost my job. Um, so I had a pretty good run, to be honest. You did. Um, the it, it, it's it's probably it's hard to say what is number one, but it's certainly in the in the running for number one is resilience, and and resilience is a constant thing. So it's not just about doing your job; it's about turning up Monday after you've lost four 0 on a Saturday. Yeah. Um, it's about turning up when you know you've you, you've had disagreement with players, you've had disagreement with board, you've been hammered in social media now, you've been hammered in you know news media, etc. And and that that you know people don't like being criticised, and and as you know, everybody is is an expert, everybody knows better, and you know sport and politics, everybody's a Monday morning quarterback and able to tell you what you did and what you didn't do. And, and you've got to be resilient because you've got to turn up at training and you can't turn up at training looking at like you've lost your last $50. You've got to turn up and you've got to try and inspire that group of athletes to get ready for the next game. Um, and then amongst that, you've got to make a whole range of decisions of how you're going to do that. Um, and, and if you're not resilient, you're, you're just not going to last in the game. You've got to have a, a fairly thick skin during the game. <laughs> Now, there's an understatement. I love it. C couldn't let this go without um, having a chat with some other people that, that know you pretty well. And I um, I spoke to one of my colleagues at Football Coaches Australia, Heather Garriock, who only played 130 times for the Matildas. Just yeah. what a remarkable career that is. And in talking about Tom, she, she spoke about, one, how good you are as a coach, how nice you are as a bloke, what a great teacher you are. And she also spoke about how relaxed you are, the fact that you're prepared to join in, you dye your hair burgundy, given some, <laughs> some special conditions. You, 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 you might finish a, finish a, a crossword puzzle um, in extra time of a World Cup qualifier game. Um, you tell the girls, hey, listen, can you get this over with because I need to go home and watch Neighbours. You know, that, that, that just brings such a big smile to, I think, everyone's face. I'm just wondering whether... Could, can you transfer that into taking on a job like America, or is it, do they just see that as far too Australian and, and too relaxed? Um, I think some did. I think at that particular time, I think it worked. When when I was in America in in two thousand in one to two thousand and four, then yes, the America two thousand circa two thousand thirteen fourteen, the the dynamic had changed yeah. a, a little bit and. Um, and it became, I think it became harder for me to establish kind of what my management style was at that time. And that, and that just wasn't with players. I think that was with staff as well. You know, I think um, it, it was that, that perception at that, that time is that, you know, I was kind of, and a lot of people said that, you know, it was probably a bit too relaxed for, for, for that job. Whether that's right or wrong, I, I, you know, I don't know. It's perhaps, I think there's probably some some truth in that to, to some degree. Um, but there's probably a variety of things that I probably could have done a little bit better in relation to that job on the management side. 
um, which I, you know, as I say, you never stop learning. Uh, oh, absolutely. But uh, I think I think that is possible, and I think mm. you know, in different environments you go to, um, the, some styles fit in a little bit better than others. Tom, through that process, or through your whole process, how important is it you've got to manage the team, you've got to manage the people that help you manage the team, then you've also got an owner or a board or a CEO, someone to report to. How important is learning how to manage up being for you? Huge. Huge. Again, it's, you know, you talk about resilience as being critical. Managing up is probably probably more critical than managing down. You know, when you manage down, you're in charge kind of thing. Managing up, you, you're not in charge. And and you're often dealing with the non-football people who quite often think the football people. Uh, wow, that's so a you're dangerous managing, breed. Exactly. You're, you're managing the frustrations. And I remember, I, I, I recall a, a, a board meeting I had with Canberra, Croatia, there was, there's always one person on the board that, that irks you, you know, that, there's always a contrarian. If you've only got one, you're lucky. <laughs> and and we had gone through a spell of, we'd won five in a row, I think we're top of the league, but we went up to Sydney and we lost 2-0 um, to the, the Serbian team, Ivala, at that time. It was one of those days. People forget you're leaving the bus at half past six in the morning with the youth team and, yeah. you know, all the things that go. And the first thing he said to me at the board meeting is, oh, your team's not fit enough. <laughs> so you've got to bite your tongue and, and then be prepared to, to challenge and battle that. So you need to deal with that however you're going to, to deal with it uh, at the time. And, and there's nothing that can tell you exactly how to do that. You know, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't get it right. But, yeah, it's very important. You know, when, when I had Canberra Cosmos, Ian Knopp, who kept the club afloat, great chairman to work with. Now, Ian would like to come into the dressing room before the game and and I know a lot of coaches and even some players senior players are like you know what are these guys doing in the dressing yeah. room it's like well the, the guy runs if he wasn't here we, we wouldn't have a club here <laughs> and, and Ian would at, at times speak to the players but never about football he would actually speak to them about you know like uh, what's happening with sponsors and, and things like that and so you know it was very important to keep him for me Involved in that, you know, other coaches would have said, no, you don't come near the dressing room, you don't yeah. come near the players, and, and basically shut shut the, you know, directors or um, other non-football people out of it. So you, you've got to, this is where, you know, one of the other things you've got to manage to actually discover, should you do that or should you not do that? And there's no, there's no specific right or wrong answer to that. But being able to manage up and being able to manage all those other people is very important. In, in many different ways because you want you want people to be on your side there's enough uh, stresses and things that you need to deal with in the job if you're fighting if you end up fighting all the non-football staff and if you end up fighting a board all your energies are taken up by non-football stuff yeah. so you need to really manage that as best you can so that you're using your energies up to manage manage the critical football part of your job Great answer, Tom. What have been some of your most enjoyable moments as a coach? That's a really good question. Um, what, you're throwing me with that one? I'll give you a bit of thinking time. You, you've been to five World Cups, four as a head yeah. coach, one as an assistant yeah. coach. You've yeah. made three quarterfinals. So, you know, the, there's things that you've achieved, but does, yeah. does the achievement always correspond with really enjoy well, yeah i think that i think you know I've, I've never wanted to say like and i think you know if you look back in players it's like people think well yeah we won that 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 was a crown of, like that was it that's a moment i remember we, we won that but i think like yourself if we speak about um our football careers and we go back over time we speak about the experiences <laughs> we don't necessarily speak about that game we won or that you know, trophy we won. We speak about a whole range of other things yeah. that happened in and around the game. Some of them to do with the game, some of them to do with off-field stuff. I, I think some of the, the things that really, when, a, when we went to the World Cup in 2007, um, that was Australia's fourth World Cup and they never won a game. And we played uh, Ghana in the first game 
in the, and we won that game 4-1. And that, that, so the, the, there's a couple of moments from that World Cup that were memorable because I think that that sort of, the way we won that game sort of said that we've arrived. We're no longer just Australia who are, well, it's just Australia. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? I think that was a real statement. And then um, we then scored in the last minute against Canada to get through to the, the semi-final, uh, sorry, get through to the quarterfinals of the World Cup. Cheryl Salisbury scored the last minute equaliser and that got us through. In the atmosphere on the bus after that game, like Hooks leads the team song, Robbie Hooker, my assistant, leads the team song. Almost, that, the bus almost fell over with it shaking. <laughs> and and so sort of those moments, because I think, not because we sort of won the game, but I think they were, they were critical moments in the programme, because I think it, what it said and what the player said is that we've kind of arrived on the world stage now. We, we don't need to actually fear playing anybody. Yeah. Um, and then when we played in the quarter final of that World Cup, Cheryl Salisbury went off injured after five minutes, our captain and key player. We lost two goals in the first 10 minutes and we came back against Brazil, who I think won that World Cup. We came back against them to draw two each and then just get beat with a late goal. So th that, that kind of tournament probably, when I look back in things that were important and things that I think changed things, those would be some of the times that would, would stick in my memory. Yeah. So they've been in the enjoyable ones. What are some of the valuable lessons you've learned along the way? Um, that you, that the job will come back to bite you. Never get <laughs> to, never think you've arrived and that, uh, that you've, you've, you've reached it and you've cracked it and you're, you know, um, and and sort of become, I suppose, too cocky would be maybe the expression I would use, because the, um, the game has a habit of bringing you back down to to earth, and uh, and I think what what's what's important in the game is to keep keep who you are, you know, um, keep stability. Don't get too high in the highs. Don't get too low in the lows. Um, and, and try as much as you can. One thing I'll try to do better is I'd try to enjoy things better. When I've become, I've just felt when I've become a coach, the pressures of games at times have has taken to a degree. So enjoy winning, I suppose, more. I, that'd be one thing that I would like to do myself better. <laughs> I, I I just feel you feel depressed when you lose and deflated. When you win, you just feel relieved and you go, and then you go on to what's yeah. next. Um, so what I'd say to coaches is if they feel like that, enjoy the good moments. Yeah. Really enjoy them because you often, unless you're perhaps a Pep Guardiola or Alex Ferguson, that aren't, you know, you're not, you're going to win or you perhaps lose more than you win. But enjoy those good moments that you win and don't get too deflated at the moments when you, when you don't win. Talk, talking about some of that stuff, the, the the whole issue of mental health here in Australia and around the world right now for for both athletes, players, uh, coaches uh, is more significant. We hear perhaps more about it with, with players, but um, you know, coaching, particularly a head coach, can be a can be a, a lonely place. How how have you worked to keep your own mental health um, in the in the right space? Have I kept in the right space? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, look, I, I, I kind of, I think, I just kind of keep fairly level. Um, you know, I think, I think your your family life and your friends' life becomes very important in that. Um, so I've got, uh, you know, like yourself, a very, very great wife behind me who who supports me and keeps me grounded. Um, I've got. You know, a family, a uh, Samani family back, to, back in Glasgow that very much <laughs> a Glasgow family that keeps you extremely grounded, let me tell you. Um, but <laughs> I've also, you know, I've got, I've got good friends. Um, and um, and, and I, as I say, I try to, uh, obviously over time, because I think you get a bit better at managing things over time, 
you you've just got to learn that you know to cope with the bad times and the good times, not get too up and not not get too down and you know there's always another crossword <laughs> you are a, a a crossword expert so i'm told you're listening to the well, football. I'm not an expert. I'm, <laughs> you're listening to I the do fo- crosswords. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get this in. You're listening Sorry. to the Football Coaching Line, yes. brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professional. We're with uh, football, I keep trying to say football, Football Ferns head coach, Tom Samani today. Tom, we're on the downhill run here. Uh, a couple of questions to go. What does success look like for you? Um, success to me looks like um, achieving things with your with your team and um, developing the individuals that have been under your care to reach the potential. Um, that that's kind of what it looks like for me. So I think if you you can um, get your team to uh, and and that that the goals for achievement are different from from different teams you know it might be to qualify for the next round of the world cup might be to win the world cup so i think achieving and developing your team and within that developing players with within your team to go on and 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 become the best players they can succeed as far as they can um and at the same time hopefully help turn them into good people yeah i i think you've uh I think you've done a terrific job there. I, I, looking at Heather Garrick, today I read a, an article on, on LinkedIn during the week. She's not only played 130 times for Australia, been a successful coach. She's now the CEO of Taekwondo Australia and is, is talking about funding for, for sport in Australia. I, I, that must, um, when you see someone like Heather uh, hitting those heights, that must warm the cockles of an old Scots, Scots Australian's heart. It does. You take a lot of, I mean, not that you've got any, you, you haven't really contributed to it that much, but you, I take a great deal of, I don't, satisfaction's not the right, satisfaction in the sense of seeing where players have come to and what they've done. You know, and someone like Heather, to see, you know, to see where she's come to in the football sense, she always was, like, very competitive, high achiever, um, wanted to play every minute in every game, desperate to succeed. And, and she's taken that into, you know, her professional life where she's gone into coaching and been successful. She's now taken on a job, a huge challenge in a sport that she's, you know, not known anything about and taking that forward. Um, you know, a great future ahead of her. You know, and, and I look at a, across a lot of players in, in that regard and um, and see how well they've done in the various parts of life that they, they've gone into. And, you know, and it's great. And I, th- I think the other thing that gives me a lot of satisfaction is that, they still talk to me, most of them, (laughs) and that you (laughs) catch up with them. Um, And you you still, you feel that you've been part of the journey. And Mm -hmm. and I think that's, um, you know, that's something that I I find really quite satisfying. Another good answer, Tom. Um, I have one more question to go, but I'm going to sneak in with the second one because I I know that you've um, you've qualified with the football firms for an Olympic Games, which should have already happened, but it hasn't. And we were talking um, offline before this uh, about what that might look like. Um, you've been to five World Cups now, and you you tend to downplay that, but of course. Um, you could be appointed with a, a home World Cup in Australia and New Zealand um, in 2023. Um, with a, a contract extension, you've been to a home World Cup for Canada as an assistant coach and seen that. I'm just wondering what that might mean to you to be able to uh, be a part of a home World Cup. I think it'd be great. Uh, you know, I, I think um, to be part of it in any capacity, whether you've successfully just extended my contract, I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> Doing my to best. see, um, <laughs> uh, look, I think it'd be fantastic for the world to cup to come here and whether um i'm involved in it in a, in a coaching sense which would be great but if not then i'd just like to be involved in it in, in some capacity you know whether whatever that is maybe a, you know i get a steward for putting, putting people to the seats you know or whatever but uh, i think it, it, it's it's fantastic for the world to cup, cup to come here and and particularly now in women's football you know when you look at 2019 that was the first global, what I would call the first global Women's World Cup. 
you know, when you've got a US player having a, a Twitter war with the US president, <laughs> I think it kind of shows that you've arrived on the, the world stage. And um, and as I say, you know, for that to come to Australia and New Zealand, it will, it will just be huge. So, you know, I, I'm be happy to be involved in it in whatever capacity. Hopefully you are, Tom. Final question. One piece of wisdom that you could offer new coaches, old coaches, coaches on their journey right now. What's a piece of wisdom you could offer up to say farewell with? Um, I think to to continue to 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 learn and continue to to develop, um, and and for anybody that wants to have a, a coaching career, as in the competitive coaching game, that be prepared to actually take a risk, be prepared to take a job that might not be perfect and be prepared to, to stay in the game. So that, that's kind of what I would what I would suggest. And a very good suggestion it is. Today you've listened to Tom Samani, uh, head coach of the Football Ferns. Tom, remarkable wisdom there from someone that's been doing this for a wee while or two, very grounded and down to earth. Really, really appreciate your time today. No, it's brilliant. Really appreciate that. Thanks for staying awake, Gary. That's, <laughs> that's a good sign. Cheers, Tom.